Okay, everybody, I'm back. I keep having, <laughs> I keep forgetting to delete videos from my phone so that I have more space, so it keeps cutting off. Uh, so, sorry about that, but just to, to resume, um, we're talking about Iceland's personal connections to disability. And by the time she was 13, 13 years old, she'd had 11 surgeries related to her physical disabilities. Iceland's own personal struggle that consumed so much of her life motivated her to center her work, disabled God, around the lived experiences of disability. Rather than proceeding like Haworos from abstractions about modernity and critiques of modernity into an analysis of disability without ever quite reaching the ground, Iceland anchors her theology in the here and now in disabled people's reflections on their own lives. And I just want to pause real quick and say you know, I don't think there's necessarily anything wrong with like, apolitical theologies of disability um, as long as they're respecting disabled people on their own terms, not trying to use them to support some preconceived notion and, um, you know, being respectful by listening to disabled people's opinions and stories and life experiences. So there are definitely apolitical, meaning not explicitly political, um, disability theologies that can still be respectful and productive, um, but, but not all of them. I just have issues with certain apolitical um, theologies of disability. But, um, so let's resume with Iceland drawing on her own experiences as a disabled woman, anchors her theology in disabled people's reflections on their own lives. But she only selects two specific people to concentrate on. She engages with the lived experiences of two women, two white women, and it's raining behind me, so that's, that's what you hear. But she engages with the lived experiences of two white women, Diane DeVries, who was born without any limbs, and Nancy Mayers, who developed multiple sclerosis in adulthood. So in The Disabled God, Iceland highlights by using, like, by using these um, perspectives of actual disabled people to make her arguments. She highlights the epistemological privilege of disabled people in knowing more about their own situation than anybody else and in gaining an alternative knowledge about human life. So that's what epistemology is, the study of knowledge and to say that uh, and for Iceland to say that disabled people have an epistemolog epistemological privilege means in part that they ha can gain an alternative knowledge about human life that non-disabled people can't. Remember that we saw this concept of the epistemological privilege of the oppressed early in the course when we were studying Latin American liberation theologies. And most basically, like I, I've noted, it means that the oppressed know more about the situations than anybody and they have a special insight to offer to human knowledge. Iceland 
argues that non-conforming disabled bodies quote disclose new categories and models of thinking and being that are rooted in daily experiences of disabled people disabled people's telling of their own stories disrupts the way in which their stories have been misused by the non-disabled the alternative knowledge that people with disabilities discover about themselves and human society enables or makes possible quote full-bodied resistance to the dominant stereotypes of people with disabilities so we have this theme coming up here again that we saw in Emily Towns's work where you know Towns was saying that the voices of black women can rise up together to sweep away creations of the fantastic hegemonic imagination that have been so destructive to black women. The Iceland is saying something similar that disabled people basically can tell their own stories to resist dominant stereotypes about people with disabilities. In addition to basing her theology on the epistemological privilege of disabled people or people with disabilities and speaking about their own lives and accessing a unique alternative knowledge, Nancy Island also adopts another liberationist principle as we've seen over and over again throughout the course of divine solidarity and divine presence with oppressed persons. Now for Iceland, as for other liberationists, God is a companion walking along the way of discipleship for those who are struggling against injustice perpetrated against them. And God is an ally in the effort to secure justice and the flourishing of oppressed peoples. In fact, one of the earliest moves that has defined the field of disability theology and has just resounded through the field from the time that it was proposed was Iceland's reconception of God and of Jesus as disabled. What does that mean? Well, Iceland, one day she had this vision of, quote, God in a sip puff wheelchair, not an omnipotent, self sufficient God, but God as a survivor, unpitying and forthright. Unquote. She sees God's presence in disabled people deemed unemployable or with quote, questionable quality of life. I mean, that's an interesting, you know, conception of God, as in a, a sip-puff wheelchair. You can only move, um, I guess by sipping and puffing. Um, and I think, you know, that shouldn't be taken literally, since God is beyond all bodily forms. But it's more, um... I think in the vein of James Cone's claim that God is black, there's a sense of solidarity there. Iceland famously extends this reconceptualization of God to the person and the work of Christ. She reconceives Jesus as experiencing a disability following his crucifixion when he appears resurrected to his disciples. Christ 
appears to his disciples in some of the gospel accounts with impaired feet and hands. His feet and hands pierced by the nails uh, that nailed him to the cross and a pierced side from where a um, spear punctured his side in, in, like, um, in some of the gospel accounts. Not all. And Iceland argues that in this resurrection body with the pierced hands and feet and the punctured side Christ is revealing himself as disabled. And since God, um, since Christ is a special revelation of God on earth in the Christian tradition, Christ reveals God as disabled and reveals the truth that humans can bear both the Imago Dei, the image of God, and a disability. Human beings can do have intrinsic dignity and worth and a disability. They can be objects of grace and have a disability. This sounds like, probably sounds like a no-brainer to many of you, but it definitely wasn't, hasn't always been the case. As for example, you'll see in the next lecture, um, where I'll talk about the moral model, moral or religious model of understanding disability, where disability might be um, the product of sin and doesn't have anything to do with um, grace. But Christ as a revelation of true personhood, the truly human being, as he's often called in traditional theology, demonstrates that full personhood is, according to Iceland, quote, compatible with the experience of disability, unquote. Iceland's symbol of the disabled God and the disabled Christ echoes prior liberationist theologies in that it, quote, resembled James Cone's proposal Oh, and this, this is Deborah Beth Creamer's analysis. Resembled James Cone's proposal of the black Jesus or black God, or a feminist theologian's suggestions that we consider God as a woman, both of which moves are intended to elevate the status of black people and women. And I don't know if you all have heard of this, but there's actually an artistic representation of Christ as a woman called Krista. It's just Christ with an A added. It's kind of interesting to um, to look look at. You can Google it. Um, despite her valuable contributions, Iceland's conception of God as disabled through Christ's post-resurrection wounds is subject to critique. For example, the critique that Christ was actually more able, or at least just as able, in his resurrected body. For example, being able to disguise himself and walk through walls, at least as <laughs> recorded in like the Gospels. Those are some of the stories <clears throat> that show up. One of Nancy Iceland's other significant contributions to the field of disability theology, besides the disabled God, was her development of a liberationist ecclesiology. 
or doctrine of the church. For Iceland, Christ's post-resurrection disabled body manifests itself not only in his presence with his disciples, displaying his impaired hands and feet. The church, too, is a manifestation of the disabled body of Christ in history. Yet, Iceland claims, while Christ's impairment marks him as in solidarity with people with disabilities, the church's impairment is its brokenness by sin, which compels the church to treat people with disabilities badly. The church is impaired when people with disabilities are not included. For example, through a lack of physical accessibility in rituals like the Eucharist. Nancy Island recounts like a very vivid experience of feeling so left out when a church was <clears throat> having its Eucharistic ritual. Like they had no accommodations for people in a wheelchair to come up and take the body and blood and um, had to bring it to her and that left her feeling humiliated. So she says that the church is impaired when people with disabilities aren't included. So despite the church's brokenness through sin, Iceland believes that the church is called toward an alternative way of being that privileges repentance and redemption. She asserts that the church is called to be a, quote, communion of struggle, a communion that's always reforming itself in you know, it's that's a formulation of the church from the Protestant Reformation. The church always reforming itself. Struggling to repent of the ableist beliefs and practices and convert to belief in the disabled God. For Iceland, the church as a communion of struggle is called also to hold itself accountable for and alter the practices of the church that isolate and exclude disabled people. For example, a church um, would be called to make sure that the sacrament of the Eucharist is wheelchair accessible um, as is like Iceland's personal experience, personal issue with the church. Iceland's hope is that the church will become a welcoming and accessible space for her and others with physical disabilities to practice a uh, what she calls non-conventional form of embodiment. And despite her tremendous contributions, in my opinion, her tremendous contributions, Iceland's book is limited in a way that she explicitly recognizes. She sees her own shortcomings. And she laments that she only writes about physical disability and not cognitive, social, or emotional disability. She describes the lack of material, the lack of theological reflection on mental disability in 1994 as scandalous, truly scandalous. And she expresses her hope that her book, The Disabled God, will, quote, encourage others to ask and explore theological questions concerning a broad spectrum of disability, unquote. And it is to liberation-minded theologies of mental disability that we're going to turn to in our Disability Theology Module 2. We're going to be reading texts by Jessica Koblenz, on depression, her effort to create a, um, to gesture towards the content of a theology of depression, making use of 
Dolores Williams's um, survival slash quality of life soteriology or theory of salvation that Williams was first working out in uh, her book Sisters in the Wilderness and we're also going to be reading David Finnegan Hosey's or at least we're going to be reading selections from David Finnegan Hosey's personal testimony and theological account of his time in psychiatric hospitals and his experience of Christ in psychiatric hospitals. And there is there is much much more. Like there's there's certainly a lot more material out there now on mental disability and theology than there was in 1994. So if you're curious about it, I'm happy to give you any like you know, just email me. I'm happy to give you other material to satiate your curiosity because this is technically a lot of what I'm doing for my dissertation. So thank you very much for coming to this lecture. And I wish you all the best.